gives me um, an instant community, um, especially me. I'm a military wife and we move a lot. It is a great way to connect with other moms. The first time I walked in um, to Mops, I didn't know a single soul. And now I feel like almost everybody here is my family in a way. Um, I just know if, if I meet another mom who's a part of Mops, like she's automatically a friend in a way. I have four little boys and when I first started Mops a few years ago, I was tired, I was exhausted, and honestly I was having a lot of mom guilt over some of the feelings that I were feeling and just coming to Mops and realizing that everybody is going through this and everybody is struggling with those same things, it was such a wonderful sense of community. We moved here 18 months ago um, and I was looking for mom friends. Uh, I have two young children and this was a great opportunity for me to meet um, other believers and it uh, coming from the military community, uh, it's hard when you first get somewhere to find friends. This was an automatic um, community for me. Mothers of preschoolers, just one of the hundreds of communities available to you at here at Shoreline. And as you heard from those uh, ladies there, they shared that just the importance of being engaged in consistent community. And so we're in week two of our sermon series called We is Greater Than Me. And we're looking at the idea of consistent community. And of course, last week, Pastor Kevin shared that Jesus himself exists eternally in community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus lived and loved others in community and also Jesus reminds and calls us today as his followers to live and engage in his community. And so today we're going to be looking at this idea of overcoming barriers to consistent communities. And before I go there, I want to actually just celebrate, just pause a moment and celebrate as a body here at Shoreline. Because last week, out of Pastor Kevin's message, several of you, in fact, dozens of you, hundreds of you stepped forward. You took one step to do more, to engage in community. For some, that meant that they actually went and started and being part of a Bible study. For others, it was a small group. And for some, maybe they even went to Wednesday night at Shoreline class. And we also, on Thursday night, we started a new ministry called Alpha. And many of you were part of that. You took a step into each of those opportunities to engage in consistent community. And we celebrate that. And we also are so thankful because many folks who had perhaps taken a step back from being engaged in community, even so much as maybe just watching online. Last week, Pastor Kevin and the body of Christ at Charlotte gave a special invitation to those who were experiencing the body away from Shoreline. And I venture to say that some of you are here today. Welcome home. We're so thankful, aren't we, Shoreline, that they're back with us, amen? <laughs> And as much as we want to celebrate, we can celebrate and enjoy the goodness of what God is doing in and through Shoreline, I think we can all agree that many followers of Jesus are missing the blessings and benefits of consistent community. And what do you mean by consistent community, Pastor Sean? Well, here, here's kind of a, a summary of what I believe consistent community is defined as. It's connecting regularly and intentionally with other followers of Jesus to grow to be more like him and experience life together in many different ways. In some, it's experiencing community in something like a structured Bible study. Or perhaps it's like those, those moms of preschoolers in a group setting where they can come together. For some, it's experiencing community, maybe a one-on-one -on -one discipleship. Maybe it's, it's reading the Bible, or maybe it's going for a hike together and experiencing God's work and creation together. Community has many different forms. And so yet, with as many blessings that we have with community, what might be holding people back? What holds people back from engaging in consistent community? Well, I believe there are barriers. And I believe that they're real and or perceived. And what's a barrier? Where a barrier is anything that prevents you from going somewhere or growing somehow. Now, when you're driving, barriers are good, amen? If there's a barrier that protects you from going somewhere. But when it comes to spiritual growth, barriers are not good, especially in the area of consistent community. 
And so I think about some of the most common barriers as we kind of think about all the different aspects of community and what might be holding people back. Here are some categories, if you will, of different barriers. First, I think we have cultural barriers. See, we live in a self-centered society today that bombards us with advertising and marketing that says that me is greater than we. It's me, myself, and I. In fact, me, myself, and I are the center of the universe. That's what we're told. Everything's tailored for me. Everything's about me. Therefore, we live in a culture that breeds this self-centered attitude. We also know that we have this thing called a digital distractor. <laughs> right here, right? And what this does is it, it actually it, it draws us into this. And what we find is the more we're drawn here, the less we're drawn here having conversations, seeing people, interacting with people. And so we have these cultural barriers. And so when the tension exists is that community, community, it runs completely counterculture to what we live today. We also know that we have personal barriers. Each one of us, God designed uniquely. Our personalities, our preferences, our dispositions. For some, being around other people can be a real challenge. And so community is, in fact, can be a barrier. We also know that prior life experience can also be an example of a personal barrier. As Pastor Kevin shared last week about community, that this is double-edged sword. That on one hand, it's this great joy, this great glorious opportunity for us to get to know other people, experience the love of Christ, and at the same time, on the other side, oh, there's pain. Because sometimes people really hurt us. So prior life experience... And it might cause us to pull back from community. See, community stretches us to go beyond ourselves and open up to others. Then the third category is practical barriers. These are things like time and our competing priorities and the demands of our life, our job, all these different aspects of our life. Maybe it's a life stage we're in. For some of you here, you're, you're new parents. And right now, the most precious resource that you have, you want, you desire, is sleep. And so time becomes a challenge because you've got to try to navigate that. And you might even be here at Shoreline for just a short time. So the temptation is, since you're only here for a short time, maybe I just, I'll just pull back a little bit. I, I won't step into community because it's too hard to say goodbye. See, community causes us to reprioritize our time and actually invest our energy in others. And I think the fourth category is spiritual barriers. See, for many, I believe that there's this false idea that, that, that we, we, we believe maybe this false narrative that says that my relationship with Jesus is about me, myself, and I. And yes, when you get, place your faith in Jesus Christ, it is a personal decision. And your personal relationship with Jesus Christ is the most important thing in all the universe. But Christ calls us to be part of his body. He never desired, he never designed us to be separated. Our creator designed us to be in community because he himself exists eternally in community and we're made in his image, amen? And so they're very real aspect. And there's also the reality of spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare, we have an enemy and that enemy, as Jesus says, his native tongue is lies. And so he speaks, he tries to deceive us, he tries to divide us, he wants to separate us. And so there's a spiritual barrier that comes against us anytime we try to step into community. And so community, it challenges us to re-examine our thinking and to confront the lies of the enemy. It's a powerful, powerful thing to consider. So today, I don't want to spend my time walking you through 10 steps to overcoming barriers to consistent community. What I'd rather do what I'd rather do is actually remind you, remind you of the blessings and the benefits of being engaged in Christian community. And so to help us remember, I want to look at God's word today. Specifically, I want to look at the Pauline epistles. These are the letters from the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul himself, who is a champion for community and a barrier breaker for Jesus. Now, you remember Paul, he was Saul, right? He was this former Jewish religious leader, and he was bent single-handedly on destroying the Christian church. That was his mission until 
he had an encounter with Jesus. And he placed his faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus called him to go and preach the gospel, to plant churches. And Paul, through the power of the Holy Spirit, wrote 13 of the 66 books in our Bible. That's 20% of our Bible authored by the Apostle Paul, superintended by the Holy Spirit. And so as you read through Paul's letters, it becomes painfully and powerfully evident that Paul practiced what he preached when it comes to community. In fact, one person might call it barrier-breaking community. I love the way one writer puts it. He put it this way. Throughout his ministry, Paul kept leaning into the diverse network that God put around him. On paper, these people had very little in common. Persians, Africans, Greeks, Romans, Jews, and Gentiles, leaders, no names, wealthy, poor, slave, and free. That was Paul's crew. This diverse group of men and women were all around Paul, helping Paul do what God called him to do. And he was helping them to grow to be more like Jesus. And so if we ask Paul today, Paul, why should I invest in community? Why should I be part of Christian community? I think Paul would first say, in Christ, we've been given the blessing and benefits of family. And see, although Paul himself was unmarried and had no children of his own, he enjoyed the benefits and blessings of family in a profound manner. And we can get a glimpse of this when we read Galatians 3, verses 26 and 28. And you go in and you actually, in your Bibles or in your Shoreline apps, I would encourage you to turn there, Galatians 3, and listen to what the Apostle Paul says about this idea of being a family. Paul writes, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Do you hear that? You are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul's not saying when we place our faith in Christ, we lose our individuality, our individual differences. But what Paul is saying, because our identity is in Christ, we are all brought together as one. And we also are adopted into God's family. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we place our faith in Jesus and we follow Jesus the rest of the days of our lives. Jesus, at that moment, we are forgiven for our sins when we place our faith in Christ. We have inherited eternal life and we're adopted into God's family. Church, let that rest, let that sink, let be reminded of that. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, amen? amen. Look to your right, look to your left. Brothers and sisters, when we place our faith in Christ. And the blessing of community is, allows us to experience the fullness and richness of being in a family. And I think Paul would remind us that although we're widely diverse, in Christ, we are part of one eternal family. Now, I know for some of you, maybe you didn't have a family growing up. Or maybe your family was a highly dysfunctional family. But in Christ, you have a new family. Now, is this new family perfect? Church, what's the answer? No, because no, none of us are perfect, but we're being made perfect in Christ. And that's the blessing of the family. And so today, for each of us, a question about this idea of being part of a family. Do I see my fellow Christians as brothers and sisters? And am I experiencing the bonds of being part of God's family? See, community allows us to care, to comfort, to encourage, to love, to make sure that people know that is what it means to be part of a family. And it's reciprocal, to be cared for, to be comforted, to be encouraged as part of God's family. And here at Shoreline, one of the, the great ways to connect in community, and we, I like to think of our small groups as a great way to, to connect family style. Because these are, these are groups of, of believers in Jesus Christ who meet in homes. And they also might share a meal together. They experience life together. In fact, I was encouraged because a couple of weeks ago, a staff member told us that there was a family in need in the church. 
And so we immediately reached out to the family and said, is there anything we can do for you? Can, can, we, can we bring you meals? Can, can, we, can we come and pray for you? Can, can we help you? And they said, no, you don't need to. Our small group's taking care of that. Now, what great joy I had as a pastor to hear that. But think about this. What greater joy that our Heavenly Father, does he know that there is his sons and daughters caring for each other, brothers and sisters, as one family. Great joy in knowing that. And so Paul, I think, would also remind us of the blessings and the benefits of a body. Now, we're not talking just about a physical body. That is a blessing, but as the body of Christ. Listen to Paul's words in Romans 12, verses 4 and 5. Paul writes, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So Paul's point here is although we are uniquely designed in Christ, we function as one body. So Paul likens the dynamics of the body of Christ to the human body. The human body made up of nerves and bones and muscles and tendons and joints operating as a system of systems, right? A system of systems. And the body has a capacity to do amazing things working together as one. The body has a capacity to soar in the air and defy gravity. Yes, that's a picture of Dr. J, Julius Irving. He put the ooh in smooth and cool. <laughs> Dr. J was my boyhood hero. And before there was LeBron, and before there was Michael, Jordan, before there was Steph, the doctor was in the house. <laughs> Incredible capacity. The body also has a capacity to soar and in the air and endure the highest levels of pain. And for many, you see this image, and that invokes right away, 1996, Summer Olympics, Carrie Strug, her first vault, she goes down and she hurts her ankle. And the second vault, she's in pain, but she's got to do it. And she does it, and she sticks the landing, and she secures the first ever gold medal for the U.S. women's gymnastics team. The body can endure the highest level of pain, and the body also can soar in the air and inflict the highest levels of pain. Yes, that's right. For you 49er fans, you know this is the catch. Dwight Clark making that touchdown grab, sending and ripping the hearts out of every Dallas Cowboys fan like me. January 10th, 1982. Now, like I remember that date. I've forgotten a lot of things. But ladies and gentlemen, that is one thing I've never forgot. <laughs> now, I hear there's a big game later on today. So we hope for the best for the 49ers. But yes, the body has incredible capacity. But as amazing and as beautiful as those images are, and painful for some, those images can't even come close to the beauty of watching the body of Christ in action. Now, we're not even going to show you pictures because you saw it on display when you pulled into the parking lot this morning and you were greeted by someone in the parking team and then you came up into the hospitality area and somebody had taken time to make those, those donuts and those bagels and that coffee available. And then you walked into the lobby and you were greeted by greeters and you walked in here and an usher helped you find a seat and you were ministered by those leading in worship, the body of Christ fully on display. Now, this is what's important, church is that every gift, every personality, every experience, every talent that each of us has is valuable and vital to the body of Christ. That was Paul's message then, and that's the message today. Imagine how much more we could do as a church here at Shoreline if every person who called Shoreline home was fully engaged in the body of Christ here at Shoreline. Imagine what we could do for Jesus. So a question for each of us is, do I see myself as uniquely important to the body of Christ? And am I helping to grow and sustain the body of Christ? And two unique ways that are available to you today, believe it or not, out in the courtyard and in your bulletins today, we have an opportunity for you, if you are interested in helping to minister 
to our children. Now, you don't have to be a teacher if you love Jesus and you love children and you want to help them grow to be more like him. This is a unique way for you to actually grow and sustain the body of Christ here at Shoreline. And so you'll see the teams out there in the courtyard. I encourage you to stop by there or fill that out. It's in your bulletin. Additionally, another opportunity, we have a short-term missions trip that's coming up in late June. It's going to Uganda to actually minister to the people that are in refugee camps over there. If you are interested in that, would you please swing on by out there in the courtyard as well, and they would love to share some information with you. Two ways for you to experience the body of Christ in a powerful way in community with others. And I think third, Paul would remind us also of the blessings and benefits of fellowship. Fellowship, there's that word again. Every time I go to church, I hear fellowship. What this means is brought together by a common interest and a united cause. And if you're a follower of Christ, you know that united cause is Jesus Christ, amen? And that's what we, to glorify God, to grow to be more like Jesus, and to go out with the gospel, to share Jesus' love with others. And that's the fellowship. And Paul himself, he was one of those who experienced fellowship in a powerful way. Paul was always on the go for Jesus. I mean, Paul was planting churches, and then he would, he would minister there, and then he would move off to a new place. But Paul's, his philosophy wasn't plant and go. It was plant and grow. And he would pour into and invest in the people in that community, even though he may only be there for a short time. Paul made it a priority to build connections. And no matter what he did or where he was at, that was a priority. Build connections, engage in community. Paul actually wrote the following words. He wrote these words 10 years after he had planted a church at this little Roman colony called Philippi, which is in modern-day southern Greece. Listen to Paul's words, and he wrote Philippians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Paul writes, It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. You see, Paul's imprisoned in Rome when he writes these. And yet Paul still is experiencing the bonds of fellowship with this church. Because fellowship, it, it, it spans time and it spans distance. And that's the power of fellowship. And so for Paul, I think the big takeaway for us is although we live and work differently in Christ, we strive, doesn't mean we always get it right, but we strive to make community a priority. In the video we saw earlier, you got an example of some mothers of preschoolers who are engaging in community. And in case you missed that, I wanted to share a couple of other quotes from, these are two moms who are military spouses. That means they're here only for a short season. And I want you to hear their hearts when they talk about the importance of community to them. The first one, Allison, she writes, God created each of us to be in fellowship. Making connections with people makes me happy. It makes me a better wife, a better mother, a better sister, a better daughter, and I truly value the people that God has put in my path to be part of my community. Do you hear that? To be part of my community. And Kelly, she writes, Shoreline Mops will always have a special place in my heart because for the first time, I learned what it means to be a child of God. These women have shown me the love for Jesus Christ in my everyday life. They have poured into my kids. They have prayed for me and my family. I'm so lucky and thankful to have been blessed by the community of this ministry and these lifelong friendships. And so if you ask Allison and Kelly or the other moms in this group, was it hard taking that first step was it hard to find time to invest in community? The answer would be yes. But if you said, was it worth the investment of your time and energy? I think you can hear the answers are resounding yes, amen? So question for each of us, am I making Christian community a priority and seeking out new opportunities no matter my life stage or life situation? And I just want to give one encouragement here because 
the natural tendency is to think that community is only for extroverts. I want to encourage that. See, God wired each one of us uniquely and differently. And so for some who community is a real stretch for them, I just want to encourage you. My wife and I, we have four children. And each one of our children is uniquely designed. Each one is uniquely created. They're all adults now. And each one experiences community in a unique way. Our oldest son, he would love to just be with a group of two to three guys going through the Bible word by word, line for line. Our daughter, she would engage in groups, primarily like groups like moms. And then our two younger sons, they would actually find great joy, and they do, because they both live here locally, in the basketball community at Shoreline, where they're with other guys, competing, striving, trying to win, but also being held accountable and actually praying with and for one another. Community takes many different forms. And so I don't know what that looks like for you, but here at Shoreline, we've got a lot of opportunities for you to engage in community. And the fourth thing I think that the Apostle Paul would remind us, the blessing and benefits of camaraderie. That camaraderie, that's one of those military terms, Pastor Sean. I say, yep, you're right. I chose it specifically for that reason. Because camaraderie is really this unique bond that's built between those training for warfare and those engaged in warfare. And as we were reminded earlier when we sang that song, I raise a hallelujah, that Jesus has won the victory, but there's a battle that's still waging. It's raging. And we as individual believers, we are on the front line. Amen? The Apostle Paul makes this clear in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12. Paul writes these words. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And Paul's exhortation is there is a battle raging, and each and every one of us has to be prepared to put on the armor of God to stand firm in the face of the enemy's schemes and attacks. And what's interesting is Paul goes on in verse 19, and this is what he says. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Do you hear Paul's humility, his honesty? He's saying, I can't do this on my own. He knows, I don't have to do this on my own. I need you to pray for me. Now, this is the Apostle Paul we're talking about, the man that God powerfully used in such a profound manner. Church, if the Apostle Paul was humble enough and honest enough to say he needed prayer, how about us today? Each one of us needs prayer and Paul, I think, would remind us that although the enemy desires for us to live separated and isolated, in Christ, we are stronger together. In Christ, we are stronger together. Because our enemy, we know that our enemy longs for us to live in isolation because that's where we are most vulnerable and he does his best work. We think about any natural predator, a lion, a wolf. How do they hunt? They find a weaker pack of animals and they wait for the wounded, the weak, and the isolated. And then they attack. Brothers and sisters, our enemy longs for us to be disconnected from community, to be isolated, to be vulnerable. And in Christ, Jesus calls us to connect into his community, to be protected to be surrounded by people praying for us, praying with us, holding us accountable, protecting all around us from the schemes of the enemy. So question for us, am I consistently meeting with, praying for, and helping other believers stand strong in the faith? Simply put, I would ask, who's on your prayer list and whose prayer list are you on? So for me, a couple of years ago, I recognized as I did a spiritual growth assessment, 
I actually realized that I needed to grow in this area of consistent community. And so I worked with a couple of other guys. We began praying, and we formed a men's Bible study. We started meeting on Tuesday mornings out near Salinas. And over time, the Lord brought more and more men. And this year, for the first time, we sat there on January 6th, and I, and I looked around the table at these 10 men. And the Lord just put on my heart how over the last two years, each one of those men, including me, had experienced a significant challenge or challenges in our lives. And how in those moments that we, when we came together, there was a sense of prayer. There's praying when we weren't together, praying for one another, sending text messages. Yes, men sending text messages, praying for each other. The power of prayer. We all need to be in a bond with other believers, that camaraderie that exists. So our final question is what is one step that you will take this week to engage in Christian community with greater intentionality? Ask God to show you. And maybe he's even speaking to you right now. For some of you last week, you heard the call, the invitation, the Holy Spirit moved and you took that first step. I just wanna encourage you, keep stepping into community. For some of you, maybe you, you kind of, well, I'm not quite sure if I'm ready to go there yet. I want to encourage you, be led by the Holy Spirit as God leads you to step into community. Now, I don't know what that is for you. It might be Bible study. It might be a small group. It might be coming to Wednesday night at Shoreline classes. It might be getting involved in the Alpha ministry. Hundreds of opportunities, and this is what I'm going to encourage you. If that's you, I want to encourage you to step into the courtyard when we close our service today and speak to those folks out there. They'd love to share with you those opportunities. And then one final invitation for those of you who would say, I'm fully engaged in community. I'm all there, Pastor Sean. I want to encourage you like the Apostle Paul. Would you be a champion for community? There's probably one or two people in your life that you could encourage to maybe take that first step or maybe even encouraged to step back into community. God's put them in your life for a purpose. Would you invite them into the community? I'll just encourage you this today. Don't miss the blessing. Don't miss out on the blessing and benefits of community. The blessings of being part of a family. The part of a body, the body of Christ. To have the fellowship and the camaraderie when you connect in community. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your work, your work on the cross that allows us to experience eternal life, to be forgiven of sins, and to be part of your body, the body of Christ. And so, Lord Jesus, today we humble our hearts. Whichever step we need to take today, Lord Jesus, we pray you would make known to us would we be encouraged by a word today, your holy word spoken to us. We thank you, Jesus, and we pray in your name. Amen.